Hello, this is Ben Thompson, and I'm a free citizen of America. Today, we are going to talk about prosperity economics, which is very essential to an understanding of the Constitution. One of the reasons why tens of millions of people from all over the earth have migrated to America is that the founders made it a land of fantastic economic opportunity. By the end of the 19th century, their formula was beginning to give Americans the highest standard of living in the world, with less than 6% of the Earth's population. They were producing more than half of just about everything. This was all made possible because Americans had a constitution which allowed them to be the first nation to practice the free market principle set forth in a famous book by Adam Smith entitled The Wealth of Nations. To survive and prosper on the planet Earth, human beings have to function on several different productive planes. Each category is indispensable to the success of the system. Here are the three major categories. 1. The Enterprisers. These are the self-motivated, highly adventurous, self-confident, and aggressive people who are known as entrepreneurs. They have the capacity to see opportunities to improve conditions and make money doing it, while others do not. They are willing to risk fortunes on new ventures and make or lose fortunes in the process. They are gutsy, stubborn, dynamic, imaginative people who are responsible for the creation of thousands of new business enterprises, thousands of new industries, and millions of new jobs. No nation can prosper unless it has a strong group of enterprisers or entrepreneurs. However, in every age and every country, the enterprisers tend to form into a fraternity of sorts, which is often referred to as the establishment or the power people. These are the relatively few wealthy families who have accumulated land, factories, transportation, communications, and banks, and eventually acquire a tremendous amount of influence on every level of society, which influence has even led to today's international banking cartel, which has a great influence on this government in establishing a new world order. The Founding Fathers recognized in the fraternity of enterprisers two tendencies which needed to be guarded against when the Constitution was written. One tendency is to get greedy and to try to take over a whole sector of the economy by eliminating, eliminating all of their competition. Another tendency is to attempt the infiltration of every level of government and gradually use the powers of government to impose their will on the people and the economy to their own advantage. As we shall see, the founders recognize these dangers and hope to devise a constitutional structure which would be the means of controlling these tendencies under control. As a group, the enterprisers are very frugal or even parsimonious in gathering their wealth, but often they are unusually generous once they get their wealth accumulated. The establishment people are the ones who set up most of the museums, many of the universities, the parks, the research institutes, the charity funds, and a multitude of other enterprises which greatly enrich the quality of life in any society. Nevertheless, while the founders wanted the establishment to be healthy and wealthy, in order to create a continuous outpouring of new jobs, they still wanted the government to remain in the hands of the people. Number two, the sales and service people. This second group has the following general profile. They are those who are conservative by nature and do not like to take the risks which the enterprisers take. Nevertheless, they are hard workers and will serve in many of the difficult and tedious jobs which are essential to the economy. Their conservative perception of life tends to make them resist any radical changes and go by the book. When they make decisions, these people tend to be more contented with the status quo than the enterprisers. They often have more regular hours than the enterprisers and enjoy a more stable lifestyle of about one-third work, one-third personal interest, activity, and one-third sleep. In this group, 
will be found the clerks in the stores, the teachers in the classrooms, the accountants, the lawyers, the doctors, the dentists, government workers, the people in entertainment, and the gigantic sales force that lubricates and fuels the whole economic system. Here and there, within this group, will be found an occasional enterpriser on his way up. This will be an individual who is ambitious, who takes over the sales group, graduates to management, and then wings it out on his own. It also will be recognized that many in this group com comprise a mixture of service and enterprise. This is particularly true in the various professions. However, the emphasis is on service to a large extent, and only a few break out and become full-fledged entrepreneurs. Number three, the physical labor group. Much of the world's work requires massive quantities of muscle power, even in our modern age of machines and computerized robots. There will always be physical labor tasks that require men and women who are willing to live by the sweat of their brows. Some of these tasks pay well, others pay poorly, but all are necessary. It is in this group that the unskilled or less skilled have the opportunity to break into the national workforce. With on the job training and strenuous exertion, they can gain new advantages and move up through the ranks into the skilled labor sector, and then on to management jobs, and perhaps eventually take flight on their own as enterprisers. It is a mistake to designate the physical labor group specifically as the working class. Often men die younger working on the enterpriser level than they do on the physical labor level. All dimensions of the world's production of goods and services require immeasurable quantities of intense and arduous work, physical, mental, and spiritual. But how do groups find their place in these various groups? It comes about very naturally in a free society with no rigid class structure. Actually, the vast majority of the workforce will try their hand among all three of these groups before settling into the one which provides the best opportunity or the most satisfaction, perhaps both. In any event, it is important to remember the warning of both Adam Smith and the founders that the system does not work efficiently unless the constitutional structure of a nation provides and perpetuates four fundamental economic freedoms. The freedom to try, the freedom to buy, the freedom to sell, the freedom to fail. This simply emphasizes that the greatest enemy of a free market economy is illegitimate governmental intervention all over the world. The countries that are floundering economically are those where governments have tried to use political power to destroy the people's free market and regulate their economy to death. Of course, there are four situations where governmental intervention is legitimate to prevent force, criminal invasion of the market, to prevent fraud, which is invasion of the market with deceptive trickery, to prevent monopoly or destruction of competitive free trade of the market, to prevent debauchery, exploitation of the vices to the detriment of the community, i.e. gambling, drugs, liquor, prostitution, pornography, etc. On this fourth point, there are those who feel that there should be no restriction on the vices. They claim people should be allowed to indulge in vice if they wish. The answer to this problem is fairly simple. First of all, private debauchery happens to fall into the category of private morals, which must be controlled by the individual and his conscience. However, the issue of public morals is another matter. In a republican system, the majority of the people in a community have the right to protect the quality of life, which they consider to be in the best public interest. This means that no individual has the right to sell, distribute, or promote any products or activities which are prohibited by the rule of the majority. Of course, government has no business snooping into the private morality of the people, debauched though it may be, but the moment there is a complaint that someone is promoting debauchery or adversely affecting someone in the community, it is a matter of public morality. The community has the right to intervene. The vices are a great temptation to a certain type of adventurous enterpriser, because debauchery ne nearly always brings in enormous profits. To protect itself, society outlaws these activities unless the majority of the community wants to allow them. In that case, the community merely regulates them, 
This is the practice in certain resort cities. This is Las Vegas, Reno, and Atlantic City. There has been a considerable amount of confusion concerning the place of profits in the free market system. Karl Marx and others thought they could invent a system without any profits. But everywhere their experiments have failed. This was because they did not understand the genius of the profit system. A profit is whatever is necessary to make it worthwhile for someone to provide the public with a product or a service when the supply of a product or service is short. The profit will be high because someone has to go to a lot of effort and trouble to provide it. However, if machinery is invented to make it fairly simple to produce the product or provide the service, then the price and the profit on each unit will be greatly reduced. Nevertheless, mass consumption of the product may allow the profits to accumulate in greater quantities than before. Take for example the ballpoint pen. This glamorous little piece of writing equipment came on the market at the close of World War II for twelve ninety five. The sales were few, but the profit on each pen was considerable. Competition and improved methods of production brought the price down to four ninety five. Immediately more people could afford the pen, and while the profit was less prepared, the accumulated profit skyrocketed. The bell point next came down to two ninety five, then one ninety eight, and eventually came all the way down to ten cents. By that time millions of pens were being purchased and while the profit per pen was minuscule, the accumulated profits were enormous. All of this is made possible by the simple fact that it is worthwhile for someone to try to put out a product cheaper and better than those presently on the market. This is the, the key to success under the free market system. Profits make it worthwhile for somebody to do things or make things better and cheaper. A corollary is this, no profit, no product. Adam Smith wanted people to realize that true wealth is not an accumulation of silver and gold, but the development of farms, factories, homes, plentiful clothes, cheap fuel, good streets, good schools, hospitals, efficient transportation, and universal access to various types of communications. How do we get these things, which constitute our standard of living? The answer should be exported all over the world. Develop a free market system that makes everything abundant and cheap. The story of the ball pen, pen is a classical example of what the free market and the profit motive can do to raise the standard of living. It makes nearly everything abundant and therefore cheap. This allows the vast majority of the people to have more clothes, better homes, better communications, better transportation, better sanitation, better education, and all of the other things which are exclusively the prerogative of the rich under any other system. In highly centralized planned ec economies, it is claimed that competition is wasteful. It is argued that it is a waste of resources to build two railroad tracks when one would carry the traffic. But that is not the way it works out. If there is only one track and only one company providing the service, an economic tragedy occurs. If the track gets in disrepair, the service is abominable, and before long it is not handling the traffic. On the other hand, if there are two or more systems competing for the business, the tracks are considerably improved, the equipment gets faster, safer, and more comfortable, the people get better service, more of them ride the train, more profits are made, and the system expands to areas which a monopoly system refuses to serve. This leads us to the conclusion that competition is the most fuel and economical way to provide a product or a service. It is the monopoly system that waste decays and degenerates into a miasma of disappointing results. What about price controls? Price controls are a political gimmick, which is often recommended as a panacea for high prices and noisy consumer complaints. Price controls always inflict inestimable damage to the market and destroy the very thing they're supposed to provide, protection of the poor. 
Let us take a specific example. A few years ago, the potato crop was very really limited and the prices shot up so high that many people found it difficult to get potatoes. The government had a remedy, price controls. There doesn't happen to be any constitutional authority for price controls in peacetime, and they don't work in wartime, but it had highly popular political appeal, and the leaders of the country were lauded for their courageous price control program. The results were interesting. At suppressed prices, the whole potato supply disappeared in a couple of weeks. Thereafter, no potatoes could be had at any price. Now what did the poor do? Or anyone else for that matter? Had the government let things rock along, everyone could have had a few potatoes, and the high prices would have made it worthwhile for potato farmers to have brought forth an abundance of this particular staple within a few more months. That, of course, would have forced the price back down, and once more, potatoes would have been abundant and cheap. Under price controls, however, it was not worthwhile or profitable to raise potatoes, and there would have been a scarcity of this product for another year if the government had not lifted its price control after seeing their failure. Now take the example of a non-perishable product like steel. When the government imposed price controls on many products, including steel, in the early 1970s, certain essential products disappeared from the market entirely. Why? It was simple, simply impossible to make a profit. It was no longer worthwhile to produce these things. One of these products was baling wire, which ordinarily sold for $12.95 a, a reel. When hay farmers found their crop in jeopardy because no baling wire was available, the car went out. We have to have baling wire. The government did not respond, but something else did. The black market. The baling wire was shipped in from foreign countries, but it had to be smuggled into the country or a high tariff had to be paid. Farmers learned that they could get the wire, but it was several times the cost they had paid before. The black market always ends up involving a chain of interlock corruption all along its distribution channels. So here is the story of price controls. Price controls wipe out the margin of profit. This results in a scarcity of production, which results in the development of the black market. And this results in corruption and criminal activity. Except for a few areas of government intervention mentioned um, earlier, which were considered necessary by Adam Smith and the founders, it is difficult to find any other area where government intervention has proven helpful. One of the major problems connected with governmental intervention in the economy is the fact that major enterprises sometimes exert pressure on the government to curtail competition, thus protecting its investments and private interests. This is what the railroads and airlines did for years. So have the utilities. Recent deregulation has already begun to reduce fares, improve the service, and introduce upgraded equipment. Of course, the founders recognize these regulations are required in certain areas of the economy, such as with building codes, environmental production, sanitation, and health, and so forth. But they set up the Constitution so that these responsibilities would remain with the state and local sectors of government unless they involved interstate transportation or certain limited areas assigned to the federal government. The breakdown of these constitutional restrictions has been counterproductive in the extreme, just as over regulation of the railroads and airlines proved to be. Is bigness bad? As far as big bigness was concerned, the founder's greatest fear was big government. In the field of eco economics, they were striving for bigness. Efficiency in production required it. The whole thrust of the Industrial Revolution, and later the Machine Revolution, was toward bigness. Iron works had to be big, shipping had to be big, later railroads had to be big. So did the telegraph and the textile mills. Bigness wasn't a problem, so long as the opportunity for competition was preserved. 
the economic perspective of the founders was virtually identical to that of Adam Smith. Encourage any legitimate means which make goods and services abundant and cheap. That was the formula. If it takes bigness to make a product abundant and cheap, so be it. Fair bigness did not clearly emerge in the United States until after the Civil War. For the first time in American history, huge fortunes began to be accumulated by the enterprisers. Some of them were fabulous. Bigness began to be suspect. How However, this was an expansionist period, which gave entrepreneurs their high day. The country was on the way to becoming the richest industrial nation in the world, and all of this with less than 6% of the Earth's population. In the process, the enterprisers began to scare people. Among themselves, the enterprisers were extremely competitive. They would bankrupt one another with gleeful satisfaction. They would wage price wars with the ferocity of military combatants. As for the public, the enterprisers pushed production up and prices down. Nevertheless, people began to call the most aggressive enterprisers robber barons. However, underneath it all, the, invest the, invest the invisible hand of technology, bigness, and competition was on the way to providing Americans with the highest standard of living in the world. The self-interest of the entrepreneurs, both the good and the greedy, Help to bring it about. How the invisible hand works for the long range benefits of the public is demonstrated in the careers of nearly every one of the so called robber barons. Take, for example, the rise of Cornelius Vanderbilt. Cornelius Vanderbilt was born in 1794 and made his first modest success in running a ferry boat across the New York Harbor. As the 19th century progressed, he developed a fleet of steamships and became America's first super millionaire, then he maneuvered his way into the railroad business where there were 1,500 different companies and the service was abominable. Take for example a train trip from New York to Chicago. In 1853 it took 50 weary hours to make this trip and required 17 transfers from one railroad system to another. Vanderbilt saw a chance to make a lot of money. He bullied his way through state legislatures, wily competitors, and reluctant financial backers to come up with a single system that could deliver passengers from New York to Chicago in 24 hours and require no transfers from one train to another. What was the result? Vanderbilt made a lot of money on this deal. People said it was the only way to go. Meanwhile, commuters between these two cities profited immensely in convenience and, re and speed of travel. Of course, there was nothing philanthropic about Vanderbilt's ach achievement. His family described him as very much of a Scrooge. Unless he could have made a substantial profit from the project, he would have never attempted it. But the people profited too. This is why Adam Smith said not to worry too much about greedy people. A strong self-interest fuels the, their profit motive to accomplish something which is badly needed by the public. Let them undertake it. The only concern is to keep them within the parameters of the law and be sure the project is for the general welfare of the people, not the exploitation of the people. The Civil War created unprecedented demands of all kinds of products in the constitutional structure left the market wide open for the entrepreneur with true grit. Economist Fred Shannon describes the situation. Free-for-all competition prevailed in the 1860s. There were thousands of independent oil drillers in the Pennsylvania fields and over 200 refineries in the country. The eastern coal fields had some 450 major operators. About 200 separate companies were making harvesting machinery there being 75 in the state of New York alone. The Comstock load bo boasted over 100 proprietors. While in Michigan there was something like 50 operators, each of the shale and copper mining industries. In fact, in nearly every industry, the number of companies or individual ventures was limited only by the law of supply and demand. Marginal producers were ever ready to enter the field when prices were high. But when demand was low in proportion to output, the competition for control of markets led to ruinous price cutting. Though this sort of arrangement was 
eminently satisfactory to the consumers, the producers, too often for their own comfort, were either driven from business or reduced to lean and profitless years. A variety of procedures was developed to stabilize the boom and bust cycle of the producers. Some entered into price agreements, but these broke down under the pressure of competition. Some began to pull their capital so they could purchase supplies in massive quantities and get each member company advantages which would not be possible if they purchased individually. The co-ops or pools of this kind were successes in some industries, failures in others. Finally, the Standard Oil Company developed the first trust and this launched a whole new episode of Structured Big, big Business. In 1882, a secret informal trust was created by Standard Oil to manage the joint efforts of several interrelated corporations. As a group, they could be managed to their mutual advantage without running into the restrictions of state corporate laws. Procedure was to have a corporation turn over all its stock to the Standard Oil Trust and receive back certificates which represented each corporation's share of the trust. In this way, about 50 persons managed 39 corporations and the former stockholders looked to the trust for their dividends each year instead of the corporation in which they were stockholders. By the end of 1882, the Standard Oil Trust had achieved control of about 90% of the entire American oil industry. In the process, John D. Rockefeller and his associates were not only making a gigantic fortune with a smooth management of a near monopoly, but the public was getting the cheapest oil and the highest quality of service provided by any oil industry in the world. Rockefeller was so proud of his achievement that he misinterpreted how the system was working and decided competition is a needless waste. He decided the country would be better off if he were running the entire oil industry. He therefore set out to eliminate the remaining 10% of his com competitors and is quoted as saying competition is a sin. However, the state of Ohio eventually ordered Standard Oil to dissolve its trust because Ohio law prohibited one corporation from owning the stock of other corporations. Therefore, Standard Oil Incorporated in New Jersey, where that state allowed one corporation to own the stock of other corporations. This way, Standard Oil began to serve as a holding company, a new kind of trust, which seemed to permit virtually unlimited expansion. Others soon followed suit and each of the trusts began to prosper enormously. However, in 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed, making any business structure illegal which operated in restraint of trade or was designed to monopolize the market. In 1914, the Clayton Act implemented the Sherman Act and the Federal Trade Commission was created that same year to investigate any unfair business practices. Was trust busting good or bad? Almost a century later, economists and politicians were wondering whether governmental intervention in these so-called trusts had been a mistake. The prosecution of most cases had not been against monopolies, but against bigness, and many of the government cases had disrupted industries, which by their very nature required big bigness if the people were to get the best quality at the best price. The problem was vividly demonstrated when Standard Oil was ordered to dissolve itself into more than 60 separate companies in 1911. The courts made no effort to examine whether there had been restraint of trade or the exclusion of competition, nor did they examine the market from the consumer's point of view to see what the alleged monopoly had done. The court simply asserted that a structure or combination as extensive as Standard Oil raised a prima facie presumption of monopoly and restraint of trade. Professor D.T. Armentano describes what a careful analysis of the situation revealed. It reports that during Standard Oil's so-called monopoly, prices fell, costs fell, outputs expanded, Product quality improved in hundreds of firms that one time or another produced and sold refined petroleum products in competition with Standard Oil. The significant point here is that the Supreme Court did not analyze these issues. 
The Supreme Court tried to recover its balance in U.S. versus United States Steel Corporation, 1920, by allowing U.S. Steel to do what it had not allowed Standard Oil to do, remain a holding company for a whole consortium of other corporations. The court conceded that the law does not make mere size an offense. Unfortunately, this balance did not endure for long. By 1982, William Baxter, head of the Justice Department's Antitrust Division, felt there had been a backlash against the consumer as a result of the mishmash of judicial decisions and anti-business policies of the government. In an editorial review, the Wall Street Journal stated, The Supreme Court asserts Mr. Baxter has laid down such a confused and self-contradictory welter of language on antitrust that its rulings don't yield the faintest idea of what the antitrust laws mean. He contends that courts and overzealous enforcers have imposed higher costs on consumers by barring in the name of antitrust some of the most efficient business practices and mergers, especially by the largest and often most efficient companies. All of this simply returns us to Adam Smith's original premise that the ultimate test is what allows the production of goods and services to be abundant and cheap. If the antitrust laws are hindering this process, perhaps they should be completely re-examined. Another point should be considered in connection with prosperity economics. Should the government intervene to reduce the number and variety of products? Don't we have more varieties than we need? In socialist countries, the government continually intervenes to discourage or prohibit the deployment of valuable resources and unnecessary duplication of products already available on the market. The big question, of course, is who should decide when there are too many varieties and which ones should be eliminated. When the British Labour Party outlawed a certain kind of cheese in England as unnecessary, there was such an uproar of protest that it is said to have contributed to its defeat in the 1951 elections. Adam Smith and the founders had a much more scientific way of deciding how many varieties of goods and services should survive in the marketplace. It was simply a case of letting the people vote with their dollars. By this automatic procedure, the law of supply and demand determines which products are desired and which are not. It also provides an automatic index of how much the people are willing to pay for particular goods and services, and at what point they tend to stop buying. This is an important element in the formula of prosperity economics. Nevertheless, the volume of varieties is an area which continually bothers certain political master planners who consistently try to meddle with the system. Having said this, we, do, we also need to point out that Adam Smith would not appear as when it comes to laissez-faire economics as were the physiocrats in France. With him, the royal government was strictly a question of whether or not there were utilitarian benefits to the consumer. In his book, The Wealth of Nations, there are numerous examples such as force, fraud, monopoly, and debauchery, which demonstrate that he knew private interests not always synchronize with the general welfare of the people. And he further acknowledged that in these instances, governmental involvement is justified. He emphasized, however, that there should only be a minimal involvement, as several of the founders are quoted as saying, he, gover he governs best who governs least. In spite of the fact that the fruits of the free market economy were making the United States the biggest and richest industrial nation in the world, the beginning of the 20th century saw many prominent and influential leaders losing confidence in the system. These included wealthy industrialists, heads of multinational banking institutions, leaders of the academic world, and some of the most innovative minds in the media. The same feverish restlessness was taking hold in similar circles in Europe. It was true, as it was, as it is with all systems, that the free market economy was in need of sudden adjustments and fine tuning, but these leaders were getting ready to throw the entire system overboard. Problems of the day include included a number of large scale strikes, the rise of powerful trust, the mysterious recurrence of boom and bust cycles, and the rise of the new populist movement in which certain agriculture and labor groups were demanding that the government get involved 
and the redistribution of the wealth. Many of these problems were either caused or aggravated by the very people who were demanding a new system. The new system would involve extensive government regulation, if not outright expropriation of major industries and natural resources. It was in this climate that Adam Smith and the free market economy fell out of favor. Collectivism, socialism, government ownership of industry, subsidy of the farmers, and a whole spectrum of similar ideas were permeating the country when World War I broke out. This greatly accelerated the idea of strong centralized government with regulatory power over every aspect of the marketplace. By the 1920s, the debunking of the Founding Fathers was in full swing. The obsolescence the obsolescence of the Constitution was discussed openly. The ideas of Adam Smith were considered archaic. John Chamberlain, one of the foremost writers of our day, was just coming up through college. He describes the academic climate of, the, of that era. era. When I was taking a minor in economics as a congruent part of a history major back in 1920s, Robert Hutchins had not yet started his campaign to restore a reading of the great books to college courses. So we never read Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. We heard plenty about it, however. Professors treated it condescendingly. We were told it was the fundamentalist bible of the old dog-eat-dog -dog type of businessman. The businessmen in that Menschenian time were considered the natural enemies of disinterested learning. We, as students, regarded them as hypocrites. They talked to competition and invoked the name of Adam Smith to bless it. Then they voted for the high-tariff Republican Party. Somehow, Adam Smith, as the man who had justified a business civilization, got the blame for everything. We weren't very logical in those days, and we weren't quite oblivious to our own hypocrisy in making use of our own business businessmen fathers to pay our college tuition fees and to stake us to trips to Europe. John Chamberlain eventually came to realize what the intellectual leaders of his day were doing. They were deprecating the founders and the free market economy to create a vacuum which would then be filled with a completely new formula. Their new economic nostrum was the very toxin the founders had warned against. Chamberlain describes what happened. The depression that began in 1929 is generally considered the watershed that separates the new collectivist age from the old or rugged individualist age. Before Franklin Roosevelt, we had had the Republic, checks and balances, limited government, inalienable rights to liberty and property and, and all that. After 1933, we began to get the centralized state and interventionist controls of industry. Actually, however, the inner spirit of the old America had been hollowed out in the 20s. The colleges had ceased to teach anything important about our heritage. You had to be a graduate student to catch up with the Federalist Papers or with John Calhoun's Disquisition on Government or with anything by Herbert Spencer or with the Wealth of Nations. We were the ignorant generation. The Depression began our education. But the first great book in economics that we read was Marx's Capital. We had nothing to put against it. Talk of plan planning filled the air. We read George Sully and Stuart Chase on the need for national blueprints, blueprints and national investment boards and government investment. Keynes was said in the future, was still in the future, but his system was already being laid brick by brick, and Adam Smith was still a word of derision.